one more minute and then we'll get started. But just for a personal moment with every one of you, thank you. We have been so excited about each one of you and about the work that you're doing. Oh my gosh. So it's awesome where you are leading us and you fit right in with our focus on innovation and the courage to bring an innovation to the point of care. So thank you for doing the work that you're doing. Very special thanks to Dr. Friedenberg and Dr. Ring for knowing you and helping to organize and bring you all together for us. We're pretty excited. I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. So um, Eileen, is it all right if I go? All right, thanks. My name is Pam Hines and I have the life privilege of being the holder of the William and Joanne Conway Chair in Nursing Research. And as part of that privilege, I wanted very much to create an interaction between researchers, inventors, and clinicians because when we bring all three of us together, we are made better. So as you know, for the last period of time, we've taken on kind of a theme. The theme being, how can we make research more efficient, more expeditious? How can we get research to have more conversations and be less mysterious with stakeholders? And indeed, we have been able to address that topic. The Conway Chair Conversations are um, eligible for CNE and CME. You will see in the chat box at some point in time that link. I hope you will all take advantage of that. But one of the points that we try very hard to make in this introduction is that we're bringing together lead conversationalists. Dr. Friedenberg is going to introduce each of them to you today. But every one of us is also a conversationalist. We all have a role. So after our lead conversationalists offer their insights and their comments, each of us gets to offer our comments, our questions. It's our chance to interact. And that's what science, that is when science gets better. So please remember, we all have a role with the Conway Chair Conversations. There are several scholars who are Conway Nursing Research Scholars. I want to first introduce Dr. Lisa Ring. And do you know that we are celebrating this month her 30th year of being at Children's National Hospital? We are thrilled to have her amongst us. And the other Nursing Research Conway Scholar that I would like to introduce is Dr. Vicki Friedenberg. And Dr. Friedenberg will be introducing our lead conversationalist today. Vicki, thank you so much. Please go right ahead. Thank you, Dr. Hines. It is my great honor to introduce our esteemed group of panelists today. I'm gonna to introduce all four of them in the order they'll be presenting and then we will get started. So Dr. Elizabeth Libby Sherwin is a pediatric cardiologist and electrophysiologist in the Children's National Heart Institute and assistant professor of pediatrics at George Washington University. She's a fellow of the Heart Rhythm Society and a member of the Pediatric and Congenital Electrophysiolo Electrophysiology Society or PACES. She practices clinical and interventional electrophysiology with special interest in arrhythmias, treatment, arrhythmia treatments and ablation, cardiac implantable electronic devices and sudden death and inherited arrhythmia evaluations and treatment. Dr. Nick Von Bergen is a full-time pediatric cardiac electrophysiology at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. He underwent the majority of his training at the University of Iowa with a short time in Michigan. Though, pra though practicing in Wisconsin, Dr. Von Bergen has traveled for outreach in Minnesota, Missouri, South Dakota, Washington, and even in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I'm getting cold just thinking about all of those places. His academic pursuits have focused on ways to improve the standard of care for pediatric cardiology patients. It was with this intent that he developed the Atrium, which we'll be talking about today, and co-founded Atrility Medical. Dr. Wes Diddle joined Children's National CICU in 2015 after attending the University of Virginia for undergrad and the University of Tennessee for medical school. He completed residency at Seattle Children's Hospital 
Pediatric Cardiology Fellowship at Boston Children's and Pediatric Critical Care Fellowship at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. He currently serves as the Director of Quality and Outcomes for the CICU, and he is the Clinical Champion at Children's National for the Pediatric Cardiac Critical Care Consortium, the multi-center quality improvement collaborative focused on pediatric cardiac critical care practice. His work focuses on multidisciplinary collaboration to identify and support best practices in the care of our complex and vulnerable patients. And Christina Dooley is the professional RNMSN, is the professional practice specialist in the cardiac in intensive care unit, CICU at Children's National Hospital. Christina has a background in adult trauma critical care and adult inpatient dialysis. She's been in the CICU at Children's since 2015, where she works on the continuing education and professional development of nursing staff. Christina works on performance improvement projects, research and leadership activities in the unit as well. Christina currently sits on the board as, as the vice president of the Northeast Pediatric Cardiology Nurses Association, where she's been a member since 2016, and she's an active member of the Pediatric Cardiac Intensive Care Society and is a member of the Special Interest Group for Nurse Educators and Clinical Nurse Specialists. She's a contributing author for the PCICS Nursing Curriculum and is currently writing nursing guidelines as a part of the Special Interest Group. Christina is presented nationally on the care of patients with congenital heart disease and nursing practice in the CICU and has served as adjunct clinical faculty at Marymount University in Arlington, Virginia. And with that, we will get started with Dr. Sherwin. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you guys so much, um, everyone for being here and really to our Conway chairs, professors and faculty for inviting me. I will be fully honest, when Vicki asked if I um, would like to present, I thought, what do I have to offer? I'm, I'm a clinician, I'm a, I love the bedside, I love teaching and I really, um, I don't know anything about innovation. I simply ride on the coattails of the really smart people who invent all of the technology that I use every day in my life, um, but I'm not an inventor. However, I have gotten a little bit into bringing some of this new technology to the bedside. And this is my first for, foray into bringing new technology to clinical care and introducing something new to the hospital, which has been quite a learning process for sure. So this, um, I'm gonna talk about this device. It's a game changer in the cardiac intensive care unit. It's called the Atrium, And it's this little tiny thing I hold in the palm of my hand. And I'm gonna explain what it is and why I was so enthralled with it. And then kind of what the process has been trying to get this into use at the bedside and where we are now and the, the road forward, which is still yet to be paved. And then have the really smart people, the inventor, um, Nick to come and talk with us and explain how he became an inventor and, um, and his new venture with the company. Um, and then our amazing CICU faculty members and staff members who have been with me at the bedside for actually trying to get these in use um, and the process there. So with that and all of my caveats, um, I wanted to get right into this. So I have to give a little background. I know not everybody on the call is familiar with cardiology or works in cardiology, but arrhythmias are a daily hourly minute by minute event for our site CICU staff, cardiac surgeons, and our electrophysiology team, that's the heart rhythm team. Uh, Postoperatively, especially patients with congenital heart disease having cardiac surgery are at increased risk of numerous types of arrhythmias from slow heart rates, bradycardia, and heart block to tachyarrhythmias, the very fast heart rhythms. And we use many tools to diagnose that, mostly telemetry, the continuous heart rhythm monitor, and electrocardiograms, or ECGs. In addition, with our cardiac surgical patients, we have many times the benefit of using these temporary pacing wires to do what's called an atrial wire study, which is utilizing these temporary wires to really identify what the atrial rhythm is. On an EKG, we'll look at it. The ventricular rhythm is the big spike. Those are obvious, but we can't always see the atrial rhythm. So we spend a lot of time pouring over electrocardiograms. So here's an example of a 12 lead electrocardiogram. In the top right, we have the typical signals. So the first little bump is the P wave. That's our atrial signal when the top chambers depolarize. The larger signal is our QRS or the ventricular depolarization. And obviously one is a lot bigger than the other. 
in this EKG, for example, it's pretty hard to see the atrial signal. We definitely see the ventricular signal, these large spikes, but it can be really hard. And when you only have one of these leads going at you or past you at full speed in the ICU, it can be really hard at the bedside to see what the heart rhythm is. So we have these atrial electrograms that are used by connecting the temporary pacing wires, which touch the atrial tissue directly to our EKG leads to get a bigger, sharper signal. This is the same patient, the same EKG, except now you can see that this V1, the lead at the bottom, and these two here at the top look very different. So this is an atrial electrogram. We get our QRS, we line it up with a ventricular signal. So we identify what that is. Then we figure out the other signal, and we see that that in fact does line up with a little bump. That's probably our P wave, our atrial signal. And then I can go through and say, okay, the atrium, then the ventricle, the atrium contracts, then the ventricle. And so this really clarifies what our top chambers are doing and what the patient's rhythm is. And it's a great tool, but the problem is it's fairly intensive just to get this little piece of paper. We need a respiratory therapist to the bedside. You have to disconnect those temporary pacing wires, either from the patient if they're wrapped up or from the atrial pacemaker if they're using pacing, put the EKG stickers on, print the EKG, and then you get a 10 second snapshot. And many times the rhythm has already come and gone and we've missed it, we didn't capture it, or it takes so long or it takes staff away from other critical needs. And so it's helpful, but it's really cumbersome. So. When my life changed, um, I discovered this little device, the Atrium, and this was a product that I see, uh, saw when I was um, had the privilege of being a judge in May 2021 at the Make Your Medical Device Pitch for Kids competition. In this competition, innovators present novel devices for pediatric patients in particular with congenital heart disease with an emphasis on the electrophysiology or heart rhythm patients and, and issues. This is an FDA supported program to address significant unmet needs in pediatric device innovation. And the innovators are competing for grants for their product as well as an accelerator program where they get mentorship in addition. Um, and this really fills a need that many of us in pediatric EP, 96% in the survey said that we have a deficiency in devices for our patients. So this was a really awesome day and every single product was great. And we, you know, it was fun to hear what people are creating and how they're thinking and what they're bringing um, to our patients. One of them jumped out at me and this is called the Atrium. And it's this little device here that I have in my fingers. Um, and this is an interface that sits between the temporary pacing leads, the monitor and the temporary pacemaker if needed. Um, and what it does is now on our continuous monitor, we have the normal EKG here at the top, as well as that atrial electrogram at the bottom. So we can see exactly where our signals are and where our P waves are. And so this provides so many benefits that I got so excited about for real life, real time rhythm strips. You don't have to wait, you don't have to delay, you're not gonna miss anything. This is available live on the monitors and we can look back in time in the telemetry system. You don't need an EKG. We don't need staff to come and connect the stickers and be pulled away from their other jobs. There's no disturbance to the patient. You don't even have to touch the patient. We get the information. We can see this remotely. We can see this on telemedicine, call from home. And it works with a pacing. So if the patient also needs the ability to pace, then this seamlessly works without any interference. So I saw this and my thought was, I need these immediately. So now we're gonna go into, well, what's the process? How did we get from that judge competition in hearing this pitch by Dr. Von Bergen to now we've utilized a few of these at the bedside. So these are a little bit busy, but you know, it kind of starts with the idea. And that was, when I heard this, my first thought was, I know him. And I hung up from the competition and I emailed him. Pediatric EP is a pretty small community. And so I emailed him and I said, I need these immediately and kind of facetiously said, stat, send them to me overnight. And he wrote back and said, okay, how many do you need and what's the address? And I thought, well, all right, let's do it. And so they shipped two samples. I met with him and his engineer to learn more about the specifics, the FDA approval, the clinical use, the cost of it, um, and how they've utilized it in their ICU in Wisconsin. 
Then with that information and my little samples, I went to leadership and I got buy-in from cardiology and EP leadership, our CICU leadership, Dr. Munoz, talked with cardiac anesthesia, um, as well as the Heart Institute leadership from the budget side of things, because of course, nothing is free. And so what are we gonna do from a business perspective, um, a part of medicine that is really not my forte? Um, as well as just cleared it with biomedical engineering. Do we need to do anything with this um, to get them in use at the bedside? So then it became the whole learning process for me. There is a product request form that you have to complete that of course has a description of it, the benefits, the patient impact, and how it impacts other products that are currently in use. Is it gonna compete with something? And that was really easy for this device because there's nothing like it on the market in the world. And the only alternative is that very cumbersome process that we talked about before. With that form, I got introduced to Maya Aridi, a value analyst, clinical specialist in the supply chain services group, who did analysis, some benchmarking, did some negotiating on um, prices and for kind of future planning. And then she and I presented at the perioperative value analysis team of that meetings with progress, with what it was kind of an introduction um, so that people were familiar with it, where it was gonna be used, who would be involved. Um, and that's an ongoing thing um, periodically. I also needed key people to help me. And that's when I met and really started working with Christina Dooley for the first time, although I'd seen her at the bedside and in the ICU. She is the, that ICU team lead, a CICU professional practice specialist, a nurse, and um, my touch point for nursing education for this device. Um, Dr. Berger and Dr. Munoz, of course. Um, Wes Diddle, Dr. Diddle, he and I have worked together a lot and he happened to be at the bedside with some of them. And of course he is as you heard from Vicki, really instrumental in championing um, in the CICU. So um, got our team and kind of made a plan. So to actually implement this, we thought, all right, who are our targets? We had to start with, we have hundreds of patients every year in the ICU. Who are we going to use for, we got a um, five total for a trial. Who are we going to test these on? So we wanted to select patients who we thought were at higher risk of an arrhythmia. Um, we presented the concept to the staff in the CICU and cardiac anesthesia. I created some educational materials to leave at the bedside when these were actually in use. And there's a um, evaluation form that we modified for the, that team um, to be left at the bedside for people to see back as we trialed these first few patients. When we have used these so far, we've only used three. Part of my hesitation and kind of um, humility coming today is that we've only gotten three in use. And now this has been going on for a while and a little bit got paused. Um, but with those three, I met the team at the bedside when patients came back from the OR. We decided to connect them in the ICU so that people could be there for education and to see them and to minimize staff in the OR and time in the OR. So I connected them at the bedside, explained it to the team, the nurses, the residents and fellows and faculty, um, reviewed the educational materials and left my contact information as they had any questions at all while these were connected to the patients. Um, with our first three, of course, our trials were all perfectly well behaved and had an isolated premature atrial contraction or ventricular contraction but no significant arrhythmia. So it was really just getting in the use, getting the logistics, working out the kinks of where it goes. Do we clip it on or not? It has a little clip that you can attach to the gown when they get up and walk around. Um, and really just kind of figuring out how much education and when to do that education with the bedside team. That's definitely been a learning curve that I think Christina will talk a little bit more about as well. And maybe some things I could have done better in retrospect. And then moving forward, we have a, still a long way to go. We have a couple more patients to trial, now kind of wanting to get somebody with maybe active arrhythmia so we can watch its benefit and really utilize those signals now that we know they can make a beautiful um, tracing on the telemetry. There's always a question of funding. Um, this is not currently a billable device, though there are possibilities in the future. Um, as I feel much of my job these days are not billable tasks that keep me busy. Um, we look at these all the time, but at the moment we're, we need to find a way to get some reimbursement for them and or even without that potential funding, because I really do believe that as a patient safety issue, these are gonna be so helpful 
time to, time to diagnosis of an injured man will be improved, the ease of information for everybody, um, the on-call teams at home, the attendings who aren't at the bedside. Um, I really think it's a, a safety and a patient care issue. So um, thinking creatively about budgets as well in case nobody wants to include this in theirs. We do need to meet with a revenue cycle team and figure out if we can find a budget for it, whose would that be? Is it critical care? Is it cardiac surgery? Is it electrophysiology? There's a lot of people who will benefit from this and the patients fall under many different um, umbrellas. So lots of talk still to be had about the funding on, on it. And then to continue our discussion of how would we use them? Do we want to use this broadly on every post-operative patient? Do we want to only use it once an arrhythmia has been identified? or only in those five top cardiac diagnoses that we think are the highest risk of arrhythmias. So still a work in progress where I would say very early in the process, but thrilled to have a couple in use already and can't wait for our next patient. So while we get ready for Dr. Van, Van Bergen to talk next, this is my little simple video of our very first one in, in use. So here it is live on the screen with a normal electrocardiogram on the top and these big, beautiful atrial signals on the bottom that line up with our P waves. Um, so really clean signals and it worked just as promised and as advertised. So thank you. Thank you so much, Libby, for that incredible presentation. And on next to Dr. Von Bergen, who is the inventor of this miraculous device. Yeah, uh, well, thank you. Just to confirm before I move on, you can hear me fine and you see the presentation. Perfect. So um, I, you know, knowing that this was the Conway chair, I actually, uh, discussion, I actually watched one of the previous ones and I thought this is really interesting, kind of a format to be able to both discuss the atrium, but then also discuss a little bit of um, my challenges with getting the atrium together. So of course I have uh, a conflict of interest when we think about CME, but it also makes me uniquely qualified to discuss this particular topic. Uh, my conflict of interest is, of course, I invented the atriamp. I turned that intellectual property to the University of Wisconsin. Um, after I did that, I looked into it some more, decided that I wanted it for my small market pediatric patients, and then uh, started a company. And now we're, I'm, I'm the uh, CMO of a trilogy medical, um, and we're using it at the UW. So I can tell a little bit of my experience, a little bit of the challenges. And then also, um, you notice the slide presentation title is white here. If you see a yellow title up here, that's be, that'll be a little bit more forward facing towards you. How can you think about your ideas um, as you try to come up with innovation and or research uh, in realms of innovation? So so this is me, this is the atriamp, and this is a patient uh, just a few weeks ago with Jet um, who had the atriamp on, and, and let's jump into it a little bit. Um, as I think about the context of this talk and potentially your ideas or your innovations, I always like to start as we think of clinical innovation with some questions. In particular, how can we best care for our patients? How can we most effectively spend our time? And how can we innovate to perform our best? And to me, that answer is oftentimes seeking improvements in the areas of greatest need. And so as a, you know, uh, Dr. Sherwin and I are pediatric cardiac electrophysiologists, so our areas of greatest need is oftentimes in surrounding arrhythmias. And so my clinical need was very much that I'm often blind to arrhythmias. Right now there's about 30,000 pediatric heart surgeries per year. There's significant risk for arrhythmias, 20 to 60% of arrhythmias. Oftentimes the arrhythmias are more likely to occur in the sicker patients. And at the same time, these arrhythmias are associated with significant morbidity, mortality, and hospital stay. Um, uh, knowing that, well, we have the bedside monitors as our standard care right now. And we'll get just like Libby showed just a bit ago, we'll get an EKG like this. And this is from one of my patients and they had a gradually increasing heart rate up to 160 or so. And the question in my mind is what's going on. And as we look at the uh, signals from the heart, of course, it's very easy to see the much larger myocardium um, as the electricity passes through it with the ventricular signals, but the small atrial signals can be impossible to see. And so we'll have a patient that looks like this, chest open, you know, very sick, and I won't know what the rhythm is. So the challenge is that bedside monitors are inadequate for rhythm identification. And so knowing that, there's actually 
protocols and standards of practice that say, well, what are we supposed to do? Well, we're supposed to, as Libby mentioned, take advantage of wires that are placed on the outside of the heart. Um, practice standards say, look, this is how you get the diagnosis. It can be especially useful in pediatrics. But once again, in practice, what does that mean? Well, we try to find spots for stickers on the chest. You wait 15 minutes. Sometime the arrhythmia is done. You can't look backwards. And then you get that 10 second snapshot and then they leave. You make a change and then you think this is absolutely crazy. Why in the world don't I have this continuously in real time? We are beyond this. And this is what I griped about for a while and actually developed a little duct tape and alligator clips that uh, my former colleagues back at Iowa uh, harassed me about a little bit, but it was the onset of my idea for um, the atrium. So the atrium is I wanted continuous real-time monitoring um, of the rhythm. And so it's a little bit like, for those in the ICU, it's a little bit like NIRS. We went from mixed venous sats and we'd get a lab, it'd take a long time. And now we have these little patches that we stick on the patient that give us the cardiac output all the time. And it's a little like that, but for the rhythm. At the same time, the atrium can connect to a temporary pacemaker. So it's a fairly straightforward device with the connections to the patient connections to the bedside monitor where we hijack the, the V lead, the precordial lead, and then also to the temporary pacemaker because we didn't want to sacrifice safety. We want to be able to pace or to monitor. So the safety mechanisms in place allow us to do any of the, connect all three together without having troubles with one or the other um, that were things that were connected to. So what did I want? I wanted the gold standard for rhythm diagnosis as judged by the HDA, uh, HA, sorry, and I wanted it continuous in, on the bedside monitor. And so as we went from my idea, so this is what I wanted, but now how do I get there? So as we face towards your ideas or the things that you can be thinking about, um, I put this slide up here. I think it's always good to start with what I would call the preliminary evaluation of your idea along with feasibility. I've had a couple ideas that, uh, for example, was it physically possible? It was kind of on the edge of physics and wasn't necessarily phys physically possible as I did a little bit more evaluation of some different ideas that I've had. But look, start looking at things. Do you have the time? Is it substantial benefit? Is it physically possible? How much time will it take to do it? What experts are required? And then prior art. So do a little bit of an evaluation even before before you start trying to push your innovation forward um, to make sure that it's appropriate to move forward with. So what did I do with the atrium? Well, I started looking a little bit into the benefits of the atrial electrogram, and there's a good amount of data out there, and I'm just, I'll put a few things up, but there's studies that show improvements with accurate diagnosis, improve healthcare costs and patient outcomes. And this is kind of what I felt like based on my need for the atrial electrogram. We also know that things with some arrhythmias like junctional ectopic tachycardia, um, earlier identification can improve outcomes. And oftentimes we can't identify the arrhythmia without actually the atrial electrogram. So we have uh, kind of added uh, weight to the scales to say there's a benefit for better discrimination. This is a study that was terrifying to me. It actually uh, was a study in pediatric patients up in Mayo. And what they found was that number one, this is something we know, as the heart rate gets faster, you're more likely to need an intervention, but at the same time, it's even harder to tell what the rhythm is. And so Dr. Sherwin's EKG before had a nice slow rate with a great atrial signal, but it was a nice slow rate. That wasn't a diagnostic conundrum. But the challenges we have is when the rate speeds up and we're actually worried about the patient, and that's when the atrium is especially effective. But in the study, what they found was that in almost 90% of the time when they made the incorrect interpretation, they had already intervened. They already had an, had an active intervention. So this is what I think is sometimes causes the Swiss cheese issue with major issues. You know, the Swiss cheese effect where you have multiple layers where you've gone wrong and then have a really bad outcome. So we're operating on not adequate enough information in making interventions that could worsen it instead of improve things. And then also my clinical experience. I was using atrial electrograms for confirming diagnosis. And, and even one of my colleagues at a different institution described having a child get from the ICU to the floor in heart block. Like the fact that they were in the ICU for days, but made it to heart block, they kind of had an accelerated junctional rhythm that would not have been missed with atrial electrogram signals. So my early evaluation for the benefits from the atrial electrogram reinforced kind of my, my desire to continue to move forward with this. And here's an example of that EKG I showed initially, surface electrograms here. And even as an electrophysiologist, I'll say, well, maybe there's a P wave here. I could convince myself that, but here's the atrium signal. 
you can see right here, I've put a little box around the atrial signals, but across the room, I can now look from the hallway and say, oh, this is an atrial driven rhythm, we're fine. So that increase in the heart rate was not necessarily due to junctional ectopic tachycardia or arrhythmia. We'd look for other things. Do they have volume? Do they need blood? Things like that. So back to your idea. So away from the atrium now to your idea. So when I started with the atrium, one of the things I was working on with some biomedical engineers was what is not my solution, but what is the ideal solution? So as I had my particular idea and I'm like, this is the best, I presented it. And then I started talking about it with other people. And for example, I said to my nurses, hey, here's what I want. We had this little 3D printed thing. And my nurses said, my patients are going to choke on that. That's, that's too small. I said, okay, yeah. Good point. Um, let's pay attention to the size of uh, you know things that would be in the uh, at the bedside of the patient. So, start thinking about the ideal solution. How can you do whatever you're doing if it's innovation with less time, less invasive, add safety, improve success? You can also use a lot of the same practice with research. What do you hope to learn? How can you ask the perfect question? So, how can you hone in enough to ask the perfect question as opposed to something too broad that can't be asked? So, as you try to improve your idea always spend some time determining the ideal solution to the research question or um, the innovation. And then also, I heard this before and I liked it, love the problem, but don't fall in love with your solution because your, your solution should be preliminary and it should get better. And, and the atrium definitely got better with inputs from clinicians, with nurses, with, uh, with the biomedical engineers. We all honed in to where the atrium is today. And then also make sure you strategize with others. Um, this even includes getting that as you get out to business realm. Make sure it's not just you that likes the idea. Make sure other people do too and can have people that you trust can have good input into your end product. Next, if you've got an idea, you've gone through your preliminary evaluation and you have what you consider an ideal solution, then make sure you confirm that it's novel, especially if you're going to go through an in, uh, invention um, because uh, you don't want to get there and find out someone's already done it. So Google search, patent searches at google.com are a couple of good ways to do it. Um, look up how is it done currently and how is it done currently at other places as well. That can sometimes give you uh, ideas for things that may be a little too close to your product. And then also uh, you have to start thinking, is the outcome good enough? Getting any innovation into the real world is exceedingly challenging. You know, Dr. Sherman even discussed, you know, this was a while ago that we had the atrium presentation, a couple samples, but how do you get it into the real world? So there's a lot of hurdles when it comes to something that you're going to purchase. Um, so making sure that you have enough of a benefit from it, if you are going to pursue it is something that's important to do. So, and then once again, is your idea unique enough? If you say, hey, I've got the ideal solution, it's unique enough, then you need to start outlining the steps. You know, what's the development that you're going to need? How much funding? What research? What experts are required? And this is also the time to start looking into institutional resources. So one of the things that I did was I uh, actually sent my idea over to the biomedical senior design group. And so that was where we had five guys that just happened to pick it. They thought it was a neat idea. Um, and then we helped move it forward uh, to a device that actually was working, even though it was a very simplistic form. But then at the same time, assess your ability to commit your time and or resources, because this takes a lot of time and, and potentially a lot of resources. So at some point you need to stop thinking, and then I put a question mark here, start doing. And the reason that I put start doing is because um, you should move forward or not. If your idea is not unique enough um, or not big enough market, or I mean, there's lots of things that it's appropriate to say, eh, I'm going to step back. And I actually, even with the atrium, I had a lot of people tell me like, look, this is a pediatric market. Like this is who cares, you know, you'll, you know, it'll be a business product and you'll get no investors and dot, dot, dot. I'm like, eh, do I risk it? And so I could have gone back or forward and I decided to move forward. Um, but at the same time, don't be afraid to step back um, uh, because it is a lot of commitment and you don't want to accept, you know, money from friends and family and things like that. And then, and then uh, say, mom, you know, sorry about that. So what was the atrium route? So I decided to move forward, the atrium route. Really back in 2016 is before is, uh, and before was really when I started adapting the idea. We went to the biomedical senior design group, multiple iterations. And then this was our first little device. And so this device, we had two little plugs over here for a bipolar uh, atrial electrogram. You could plug a little device in here with the pacing if you needed. Um, and this allowed us actually to start doing pig testing where we learned a lot more about how things work and how they don't work. Um, I did IP submission to the UW, 
uh, they started to go through patent protection for the idea. Then I started to look into a very basic market analysis, and then I decided to take a leap. So formed an LLC with my part-time also unpaid CEO. Um, we hired two biomedical engineers um, to be our full-time people that started moving it forward. We went through FDA, contract manufacturing, and then eventually here. And now we're trying to get the device out and particularly to pediatric centers. And so if I would say, okay, what are some of the wisdom, what are the pearls of wisdom that I have from my journey? Well, number one is seek help from your institution, but also don't expect others to do the work. So there's a lot of people that will give advice about how to move forward, but of course, nothing, unless you're doing it and you're pushing it forward, or you have someone specifically do it, it, the, the, it doesn't move forward. So realize that um, you're going to have to do the work to move it forward. Next, risk is scary for many. That includes, uh, you know, for example, uh, the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation is a uh, the patent protection office of the UW, and they have a two billion dollar endowment. Like it's nutty. They've got crazy amounts of money. Um, but even with a UW innovative device, we said at one time earlier, said, "Would you help support us?" And they're like, "Well, no, we can't. You know, your market's too small." And uh, and so. Even for huge institutions, risk is scary. So you really need to get a good amount of effort forward before people will jump on the kind of the bandwagon and help support you. So, so realize that there's always a hurdle to get over before you get other people to, to help support and move. And then it, this is a, so what someone told me, and I think it's fairly true. It's better to cry earlier than later. Um, so once again, it's a lot better to not have accepted, you know, money from your mom to help support your business, start your business, uh, and then say we lost it. So, so cry earlier. If you find that there are reasons that you should stop, stop and keep thinking and wait till you have the, the next uh, best idea. Um, so it, it's, uh, it includes things like looking at patent protection and stuff like that. So back to the atrium. Where are we with the atrium at the UW? Well, the UW, we started using it, uh, you know, about a year ago and have done, did research on it. And then eventually we've actually moved forward to protocolizing it. And we actually use it on all patients with atrial epicardial wires. We started with just the research patients. Then we found out sometimes as we we're hooking things up that we were missing diagnoses. And then the PICU started asking for it. And then eventually we said, you know, should we just, and, and actually you have to stay out of the decision-making. I, I acknowledge that I have influence, but I cannot make decisions with purchasing the DW. Um, and eventually the, the cardiologist and Piggy said, let's just put it on everybody. And so, uh, so that's where we are. We put the atriamp on all patients with atrial epicardial wires and continuous monitoring. As I mentioned, this is my patient with JET from just a couple of weeks ago. So you can see this nice ventricular spike and right behind it, if you look down, where's the spike you see on the atrial electrogram? that you don't see on the surface electrogram. Well, this spike right here tells me that the atrial signal is not where it should be. If it was a sinus rhythm, it's right on the back end here. So this is jet. So from across the room, I could tell that this was an arrhythmia. And I don't expect non-electrophysiologists or, or intensive care people to necessarily know that, but it's beautiful. So where does the atrium go from here? So based on my experience, based on the frequency of arrhythmias, the critical nature of patients, the risk of misinterpretation, misdiagnosis, I personally am you know, a member of the choir here, but I believe the atrium will become the standard of care for post-operative management, a little bit like NEARS has for lots of patients. Um, so knowing that once again, I'm exceedingly biased uh, because I invented it because I wanted it. Uh, but at the same time, I hope you guys will think that as well. But we now have another substantial hurdle is how do we actually prove the benefit of new technology? And so if I would say, you know, first of all, if you invented the technology, the vital first step is make sure you're crazy anal retentive about a conflict of interest management plan. So, um, so anytime you, of course, I do research on my uh, device, I have a conflict of interest. So I actually have a very detailed conflict of interest management plan. And I work with people frequently to make sure that I have appropriate oversight, uh, and am within the bounds of my research. So that's the important first step. But then you need to start understanding what are the needs uh, that need to be proven and what are the barriers to adoption as you try to move uh, your innovation forward. And then once again, similar to earlier, how do you develop the outline for your product or your invention? How do you outline or develop uh, what your steps are that you needed for research? And so this is a little bit of the outline that I did for the Atriamp. And, and also I put in here, I noticed the yellow opportunities for, for you guys. Um, so the Atriamp is really being used at UW-Madison and then it's being trialed and tried by a few centers. And we 
for the first time ever have continuous real-time highest quality signals on the bedside monitor that are oftentimes reported. This is a unique opportunity. There's a window that is open for a ton of areas for research. So knowing that, jump on in. I'd love to see other centers start doing research on the highest quality signal now continuously in real time. But what did I do first? So here at the University of Wisconsin, first we really focus on nursing staff education about the atrium. This was vital. You had to make sure that the nurses were comfortable with it, the setup was comfortable, and that the staff was used to it. So I gave some talks about interpretation of the atrial electrogram. Um, we did a repeat talk just recently, even though we've been using it for about a year. And then also we have continual discussions with the end user needs so that we can understand what the needs are. And this is what I would say is probably where you guys are today, too, is like you're just starting to use it. Make sure that you get good education. Make sure you understand what the end user needs are. From the research standpoint, what I wanted to start doing then was start moving beyond that. How do I actually confirm that it's not just a good idea and I don't just like it, but how do we confirm that the new te technique is better? How do I then confirm the provider experience? So we're already working on this, but in the future, I'm planning to not only confirm that the technique is better, the provider experience, but I want patient outcomes I hope to find that patient outcomes are better and then the hospital outcome is better. So finances to the hospital. And then I'm starting to look towards the future. So what are some of the plans as we step forward through proving that a innovative technology is actually the best thing for everybody? So, well, one of the things that we did, as I mentioned, was try to confirm that the data is better. Diane Brown, one of my PICU fellows, um, did the first study of the evaluation of provider confidence and accuracy when evaluating surface versus atrial electrograms. And what she found was that there was an improvement in accuracy of diagnosis. When we took all arrhythmias, including sinus tachycardia, the p-value was only 0.7 for improvements in accuracy. But People were really good at sinus tachycardia with the atrium or without. As we looked at some of the uh, you know, concerning rhythms, JET, VT, or atrial ectopic tachycardia, the p-value for improvements in accuracy was greater than 0.05, and we had a dramatic increase in the confidence. So sometimes even things with like sinus tachycardia, people would say sinus tach, and pretty much everybody was right, and they'd say, I'm 60% confident. And then once we had the atrium signal out there, they'd say, oh yeah, that is definitely the p-wave, and now we're 90% confident. So we had dramatic improvement in provider confidence and improvement in the accuracy. We are now going from our initial pilot study, just had 40, pay, 40 providers that took the test to a larger study. And I'll, uh, I maybe will put this little link here in the chat later because we're trying to brought it to other people that have taken care of PICU patients, of ICU patients. And so Diane said, hey, would you be willing to help me with my fellow project? If you could, here's a survey. So that's a survey that is actually the next slightly larger uh, pilot study. And so I'll put that in the link after I'm done talking, just in case someone would like to help uh, Diane Brown out. So next, what we're doing is we're doing our next step is evaluating provider experiences, personal interviews, end user experiences, things like Likert sales, like one through five, how much do you like this? Um, overall, this is really unique. And this is one of the best opportunities, I think, for understanding where to go. So it's really positive, but at the same time, it uncovers areas for improvement and a research. Um, so this is one of the punchlines for if you're going to be working with innovation, pay attention to your experience. So for example, we didn't always know patients were in an arrhythmia until the atrium was attached. This has happened multiple times. Does this actually allow us an opportunity to evaluate the time to diagnosis or misdiagnosis? So right here, we've got potential for different research opportunities. And what about this? We're ordering less atrial EKGs. We don't need them anymore. And so knowing that, could we actually evaluate the opportunity for cost savings? So there's different directions that actually with clinical use, we can sometimes try to uh, say, can we have a particular benefit? So as you guys start using it, perhaps you'll see some of this too. Okay. There's also, sorry. go ahead, let me. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I might jump in and talk about the patient or the provider experience side. Um, I want to leave time to be sure that Wes and Christina have some time to talk too about their um, experience so far in our use of children's. Do you have a couple more slides? I have, I think maybe two more slides. That's about it. Thanks. I'll be really quick. Uh, the last, this one was just address challenges. Sometimes we'll have a small atrial signal. This is a surface electrogram of a patient. And you can say, well, maybe there's a P wave, but then here's the atrium signal. So here's the atrium signal. You can see here's a little sharp deflection. That's actually where the atrial signal. So I suddenly feel more comfortable, but I was frustrated that the atrial signals were small. So what I'm working with my surgeons right now, this gave me an opportunity to say, hey, uh, Petros, my surgeon, uh, where do you put these atrial epicardial wires? And he said, well, I like to put them kind of right on the atriotomy scar. I said, what? 
on the Ichi Omni scar, that's where you're going to have, uh, you know, scar. And uh, that's about the worst spot for replacement of an epicardial wire if I'm an electrophysiologist. And he said, well, it's less risk for bleeding. So, so knowing that, we're now looking into evaluation of optimal sites for placement of the atrial wires. And then other things like improvements in education because of discomfort and or things like, can we move towards automatic uh, interpretation of an atrial electrogram? Better signals, can we actually move that towards? So different uh, challenges that we can address to try to move forward with the kind of that interface with innovation and research, both with clinician and nursing research, a lot of neat opportunities. So key points, um, I will just zip through it like this because I also want to leave time for everybody else, but it's essentially like seek innovation in areas of greatest need, spend a lot of prep time beforehand, and then a lot of time continually improving, realizing that, uh, that perseverance is vital and, and, uh, and that there is a component of discomfort as you accept this risk with moving forward. Okay, I'll take a breath. I tried to zip through that relatively quickly. Hopefully I didn't uh, bore you all, but I am also excited to be here, here about uh, actually real person user experiences too. I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Nick, for that incredible in inventor's perspective and your enthusiasm is just beyond palpable. <laughs> That's not a problem of mine, yep. <laughs> So next up is Dr. Wes Diddle from the CICU to talk about the experience from that end. Hey, thank you. Um, and yes, the enthusiasm is palpable even, even on Zoom. Um, uh, so uh, I, I thought you made a lot of uh, excellent points there. Uh, and probably uh, one of the most important one, ones was mentioning that uh, there is both clinical and nursing uh, uh, involvement that's critical. Uh, to bringing anything to bear in the clinical environment. And that's why both Christina and I are on here. Um, for those who haven't been in a cardiac ICU before or in a pediatric cardiac ICU, it's a very complex environment. We have some of the most vulnerable patients in the hospital. And those patients are vulnerable both over the long term, but also in some short windows where they're extremely vulnerable and, uh, and require a lot of high intensity monitoring. Um, the staff that cares for those patients, um, nursing and medical in particular, but also other ancillary staff like respiratory care, social work, um, um, have a constant barrage of data coming at them uh, that they have to quickly integrate and separate uh, important from uh, white noise. Um, and then there are also a number of asks that are periodically heaped upon them, uh, whether those asks are for part of a project uh, or for administrative work or something else. Um, so introducing novel practice to the bedside, uh, it holds a lot of promise, but it can be a real challenge. And I think there are two big boxes maybe. Um, one is where you're literally trialing something. And I don't mean in the sense of a clinical trial, but just trying it out. We're gonna do a handful of these and see how it goes. Um, and the, and the other is we're going to be incorporating a new um, paradigm into our practice. We're gonna change the way we do something and we're gonna change the way we do it all the time. And while the second thing may sound like a bigger uh, project in, and in some ways it is, um, trialing something is in many ways uh, exceptionally challenging um, because as Libby mentioned, she had uh, five, I think, devices um, and so you can educate everyone extremely well with the most wonderful uh, Zoom-based PowerPoint presentation um, uh, in the world. But if only two of the listeners actually see that device in action sometime over the next six months, the chances that they remember everything that you told them are quite small, uh, even if it's a great idea. Uh, and so um, as was the case, as is the case here in the ongoing uh, work, um, a clinical champion is really necessary to have somebody who's invested and who, um, like it or not, is available um, if and when uh, the, the product is trialed. Uh, they've already laid some groundwork with education to medical and nursing staff, but are there for just-in-time refreshment of, uh, of education um, and are available sort of on call to be able to, to address the things that nobody predicted and that somebody predicted might come up when you're using the product. Um, so I think that, you know, Libby's taken on that role and, and seeing some of the challenges of it firsthand, uh, but, it's, but it's essential. Um, I think 
And the other thing for trialing is, is really an active solicitation of feedback. Um, there has to be a, a cycle of we're trying it out, we're educating you, you try it out, and then we're asking for feedback on the experience, and then we're incorporating that feedback into changes in education, uh, changes in how we optimize its use, uh, questions back to the inventor in Wisconsin, um, uh, whatever needs to happen. Um, I think, um, you know, moving forward, uh, you know, it, Libby's touched on some of the challenges of trying to ultimately make the leap from trialing to one day um, incorporating into broader practice. And uh, that's going to require continued active feedback from nursing and medical and buy-in from leadership. Um, so as said, the bedside action that happens is really driven by nursing staff, um, whether the physician is a, an intensivist or an EP doctor, we often arrive to the bedside late in the game. Um, and so the earliest recognition of anything being amiss with the patient really happens at the nursing level. So I'll um, turn things over to Christina to give some thoughts on the nursing perspective and the challenges of novel practice uh, for her group. Thank you, Wes. Um, I, I'm sure most of you know, uh, change is difficult for most people. So um, it was a little bit challenging to uh, bring something to our group. We have about 80 plus nurses spanning anywhere from new grad all the way up to I think uh, 35 plus years is our, our most senior nurse. And so there, there's quite a breadth of experience um, and quite the spectrum of experience in our unit. Um, and we certainly have our, our innovators and our early adopters and then our laggards. And so um, it, it is one thing to, to Wes's point to be uh, ready to sort of change practice and have our mindset that we are going to enculturate something new um, versus like, hey, we're going to try this, we're going to try this new thing. Um, and so from an education perspective, we did want to make sure that the nurses had an opportunity to at least see the product, um, learn a little bit about it so that they at least had it in the back of their mind, right? They, they have they may not remember it, they may not have every detail of the education that they got initially, but it wasn't this completely novel brand new concept. Um, and so it, the stars aligned beautifully and we did have our annual skills session. And so we were able to introduce the atri amp itself to the nurses. They were able to put hands on it, touch it, move the pieces without it being attached to a patient. I think simulation is really important for nursing. Um, it's sort of that safe space to do the practical things without it being, you know, uh, there's no, um, there's no harm, there's no ability to sort of quote unquote mess up. Um, and then having Dr. Sherwin at the bedside and having faculty at the bedside with the knowledge and with the just in time education, I think is probably the most paramount for the nurses. Um, because they had that resource and then having our education team, we sort of educated the educator once I learned about the atri amp, um, being able to have all four educators have the opportunity to act as a resource for the bedside nurses on post-op day one, where the patient is starting to escalate a little bit, but then you can still go in and play with the atri amp a little bit. You can troubleshoot it a little bit. You can talk about it a little bit more. Um, I think having that combination, having your clinical champion, but then having that combination was really helpful. Um, and even though we're sort of still just in this trial phase, I think I have faith that we're gonna implement this. I'm gonna put it in the universe. I have faith, Libby, that we're gonna implement this into our unit. We're just gonna say it for 2022, I'll say it out loud. Um, that's probably the, the approach that we're gonna continue to use is having it as like a simulation option, but also doing like the, the multifaceted teaching, right? Like our just-in-time teaching, our see one, do one, teach one, our train the trainer. Like I think you need that multifaceted approach. One, because you have multi-generational learners in your nursing staff. Um, and two, you have a device that as of right now is sort of like a lower yield, but higher value to me. Um, situation where you want someone to really evaluate it, use it, understand it so that they can give the feedback. Um, so that's 
sort of how we treated it from a nursing perspective and how I was viewing it when I was working with Dr. Sherwin and with our nurses when we we're trying to get some of the, the feedback when we we're using the atrium. Thank you so much, Christina and Wes. And yeah, I think you guys hit so many nails on the head. You know, in one step, oh, it's pretty simple. Just plug it in and you don't have to do anything to it, right? But then like it's change, it's new. There's so many people involved. And the decision of do you train 80 people if six are going to be involved? Or do you kind of introduce it, get your feet wet a little bit, and then train? I think those are really hard questions. Um, but I appreciate your support and um, all of the education that you guys have done. And I agree, this is going to be our year. We're going to use them more. We're going to find funding. Thank you all so much. I'd like to, in the last few minutes, open it up to the participants and see if anybody has questions. There was one question in the chat from Dr. Dorshow asking if what if two different institutions are involved? Dr. Dorshow, is that for Dr. Von Bergen in terms of developing something when you have intellectual property amongst different apps? Yes. So, uh, so this is something that I'm not quite sure how to answer. Um, and uh, I had a brief discussion with the University of Wisconsin Wharf uh, before about what if other people are involved. And they essentially said, um, we've got ways to deal with it. Let me know if that happens. And so knowing that, I've only dealt with Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation with my particular intellectual property. Um, but my understanding is there's work in the background that's done if there is co um, uh, inventorship on particular ideas um, and the and the different organizations figure out how to divvy that up. Uh, I don't know quite how that is. My I think it's something like relative percentage of effort that the inventors decide on then gets distributed to the uh, relative uh, institutions. But, but I can't say that for certain. Of course, if we go into the research realm, then that would be just the typical uh, research protocols where we uh, do you know, data use agreements and all those things. There it is. I see interinstitutional agreements is the route. Yeah, and when we get to that point, you know, uh, Dr. Sherwin and um, Dr. Von Berger, you should definitely speak with us at Innovation Ventures. So we do this all the time, you know, enter into uh, interinstitutional agreements for joint uh, collaboration. Uh, research actually um so but congratulations uh, you know this is a great progress since i last saw your presentation uh it was i believe 2021 early last year so great progress thank you and part of the great learning for me has been the depth of people and organizations within children's national right there's an innovation group who says, just come to us if you want to do these things. There's people that can help. Um, so if there are ideas or other things to incorporate, I think part of the challenge as a really purely clinician is knowing who to go to um, and saying yes to opportunities. When I got the invitation to be a judge for this competition, um, I thought that sounded fun and I hadn't done anything like it. And it was just, it's been great and it's opened so many other doors. So for fellows, as um. Uh, Dr. Wernowski said in a message, just say yes, things open doors to other things. And so the more people you meet and more things you're involved in, the more opportunities there are. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I, we should uh, talk further with both of you and see how um, NCCPDI, the National Capital Consortium, can help you further. I know that, Nick, you are also being supported by CTEP. Um, and that was one of the reasons that we had to follow some of the FDA rules in terms of um, uh, financial support last year, but uh, come back to us. It's a new grant year and see what we can do for you. Thank you. And also, um, so Christina, I did put a little uh, link. We at the UW, one of the things to address challenges, especially with nursing education, is uh, we put together tutorials for fellows and nurses. Um, but there's, I put a little link to some web videos that my nurse, Jenna Torgerson, put together um, with me to try to uh, interpret introdu introduction to atriamp and basic atrial electroamp interpretation. So it's one of the things that has helped the nurses feel a lot more comfortable. They love it. They're like, hey, this is great. I don't want to interpret the complex stuff. Stuff, uh, 
but but they sure like confirming sinus rhythm very easily. So I already copied it to my clipboard. No, oh, perfect. <laughs> You're on it. <laughs> Wonderful. Dr. Hines had to step off. So on behalf of her and our Conway team, we just want to thank you all so much for this amazing, amazing conversation. You brought every perspective to the table and it was tremendous learning for all of us. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Hope to see all of you in March and stay warm up there in the Midwest, Dr. Von Bergen. Do what I can. <laughs> thank you all very Thanks, much. Take care. Nick, I put a couple comments in the chat for you with, with regard to the survey that may be helpful. Thanks for passing that around and a great presentation. I'll, uh, I'll look it over. Thank you. Thanks. Take care.